They don't know what they're seeing. Right? Go on. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. Mm -hmm. And I will give thee tables of stone. Yep. And a law. Right. And commandments which I have written. Yep. That thou mayest teach them. Yep. And Moses rose up. And his minister Joshua, mm -hmm. Joshua, and Moses went up into the Mount of Elohim. Okay, that's good. Mm -hmm. So he told Moses, you come on up. I'm going to give you tables of stone. I'm going to give you a law. I'm going to give you commandments. And you're going to bring these down, and you're going to put that law in the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't built yet. And, of course, at that moment, Moses didn't even know about the Ark of the Covenant because he had not been given the vision, right? Right. So Moses goes up into the mount for 40 days. And during that 40-day period, during the first seven days, he, he receives the vision of the creation. And then the seventh day, Yahweh at rest. And of course, Adam and Eve are at rest during that vision. And then the next 33 days is where Moses receives the vision of the tabernacle and how it's to be built and how it's to function and how the priests are to operate within that tabernacle. So Moses, again, he sees Adam. He sees, he sees Adam being created out of the dust of the earth. He sees Eve being taken out of Adam out of, from, and created from the rib and from the womb. And they're both at rest in the garden. Okay, Moses comes down with the tables of stone in his hand. And on his way down, or even before, Joshua says, there's a noise of war in the camp. All right? See if you can find that. I'm not sure what chapter that would be in. I'm sorry. 31, 32? Okay. I'm, I, I am not sure. 32, 16. Mm -hmm. Exodus 32 and 16. And the tables were the work of Elohim. Right. And writing was the writing of Elohim. Right. Graven upon the tables. And he wrote those. Those tables of stone were written as he was speaking that law down to the children of Israel. So when Moses got up there, they were already prepared. Okay. Go on. 17. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted... He said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. There is a noise of war in the camp because what the children of Israel had done was they had built this golden calf and they were down here worshiping it and they were partying, having a good time. And of course, this is a noise of war unto Yahweh because now they're not worshiping Yahweh. They're worshiping somebody else, right? And he had just got done an hour ago <laughs> telling them, don't you worship anybody but me. Don't you put any gods before me. Don't you make anything out of anything that looks like anything on this earth. <laughs> yep. Right? And what did they do? They just, you know, the first three commandments. They didn't even listen, you know. And this is an amazing thing. They heard him speak down. And they were so petrified of what they heard there, Moses, right. you need to go talk to him yourself because if we hear this anymore, we're going to die. Right. You know, we can't take this. And you would think that just that alone would be enough to instill fear into him to obey the law. But stiff-necked as they were, wasn't going to happen. Right? Okay. So... Moses comes down with Joshua, and he sees these people at war with Yahweh. And he waxes hot, and he throws down that table, the tables of stone. Now, he was supposed to put these tables of stone into this Ark of the Covenant. But this Ark of the Covenant had not been built yet. So that's showing that there was nowhere at that point in time for Yahweh to put his law, because it had not been prepared. Their souls, their heart, their mind, and their souls had not been prepared to receive Yahweh at that time. Okay? <laughs> so, Moses spends another 40 days down here, and of course he's, you know, telling the children about his vision up there. Moses, what, you were up there for 40 days, you know? What was that all about? He goes, well, I was given a vision 
of what? And he goes, well, in the beginning, <laughs> just, you know, that's not necessarily how it went down, but, you know, just to give you an idea. You know, he goes, well, in the beginning of it, I saw that the heavens and the earth being created. So, um, and he tells the children of Israel that they're to build this, this tabernacle. And a tabernacle is a dwelling place for the soul, right? So, and there is no Ark of the Covenant because this is where the stones are to be laid, is in this Ark of the Covenant. So this is the first thing after Moses comes down. He has the children of Israel build this Ark of the Covenant during the next 40 days that he is down from the mount. And then 40 days afterwards, he carves out two stones out of the mount, out of the base of the mount, just like the ones that Yahweh had given him and brought down. And he takes those two tables of stone back up into the mount where Yahweh writes, rewrites the law. Now, let's go back to Jeremiah. Yes, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 and 32. Sure, yes. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand. Okay, so he's going to make a new covenant. This is what he's telling Jeremiah here, that he's going to make a new covenant with the children of Israel, not according to this covenant back here that he made with the children when he took them by the hand. Go on. Out of the land of Egypt, mm -hmm. which my covenant they break. And they broke it. Although I was a husband unto them, right. say Yahweh. Yep. But this shall be the covenant that I would make with the house of Israel after those days. Okay, so say, stop right there. And don't lose that spot because we're going to be coming back to it. Um, so he says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Actually, he just says with the house of Israel. After those days. Well, what are after those days? Those days would be the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Okay? And it is after these days that he will put that new law in their hearts and in their minds. So this is showing, this is a pattern here, because it is after he goes up into the mount the second time that he comes down, the ark is now built. The tabernacle isn't built, but the Ark of the Covenant is built. And this Ark of the Covenant here is a three-in-one piece. Okay, we have an Ark proper, the mercy seat, and the two cherubims. And these are all put together as one, showing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the unity of the Spirit being one. And you can't separate the three, because once they got this together, it wasn't coming back apart. <coughs> All right, go on. Okay. Um, but this shall be the covenant that I would make with the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. After those days, say Yahweh, mm -hmm. I would put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Okay, so he's going to write this law in their inward parts. He's going to put this law, this new law that Moses went back up because that's what this second tables of stone is symbolical to, is the new law that Yahweh is going to put in man after those days. Okay, and that's what this second tables of stone is symbolical to, is that that new law that Yahweh will write in the hearts and in the minds. So after Moses comes back down after his second 40-day trip, which during that time, he saw, again, a rerun. Yahweh re-showed him because he had to bring some things back to his remembrance about what he wrote in the first chapter of Genesis. You need to make a few corrections here, so I'm going to show you again <laughs> what you got wrong. <laughs> And then he also shows him the uh, genealogy. Of course, I'm sorry, I missed. After he 
is shown the seven days of creation again. Then Moses sees the fall of Adam. He sees Adam or the, the Lucifer come into the garden and tempt Eve and her eat the fruit and then give it to her husband who willingly takes of the fruit and dies for his wife. Just as Yahshua the Messiah came in and willingly died for his bride back here. Okay? Where was that? Is that Galatians 4 and 4? Yeah, let's go ahead and get that. Galatians 4 and 4. That wasn't really what I was looking for, but that's okay. Galatians 4 and 4. <laughs> and when the full of... What? Galatians 4 and 4. And when the fullness of time was come, Yahweh sent forth his son made uh -huh. of a woman. So when made the fullness under the law. of time was come here... The fullness of time was come. Yahweh, actually, it would be at the birth, but, you know. Yahweh sent forth his son. Go on. Sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, mm -hmm. to redeem them that were under the law. That's what I wanted. He was born under the law. He was made under the law. He came to redeem them that were under the law. Okay? Okay. He's not here to redeem Gentiles because Gentiles weren't underneath this law, right? But now Gentiles were underneath this, this transgression. They were included in this transgression here with Adam and Eve. All men were included in this transgression. Everyone was born dead. Your soul was born dead. There is no Yahweh, no Yahshua abiding in your soul until the Holy Spirit enters in. And that's what this is, that he also came to take care of this transgression, too. But, as it says there in Galatians 4 and 4, read it again for me, please, Roger. Galatians 4 and 4. And when the fullness of time was come, Yahweh sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Mm -hmm. So he came to redeem them from the law that they were under, so that they may receive the adoption of sons, which means that grafting in of Gentiles. Okay? So, after Moses' third trip up into the mount and back down, the Ark of the Covenant is now built, and he puts those tables of stone into the Ark of the Covenant, and that Ark of the Covenant is placed back here with Joshua. And Joshua is abiding on the backside of the tent. He's not camped out with the rest of Israel. Right? And this is the, uh, the meeting tent of the congregation. Okay? And this is where the tables of stone and the Ark of the Covenant are placed until the time comes for this tabernacle to be built. Nine months Moses gathers, gathers up all the, the materials that he's going to need to, to build this, this uh, tabernacle. And after nine months or 40 weeks, this tabernacle is complete. And it is dedicated and sanctified. And Yahweh, seeing that Moses had done it by the pattern, go ahead and get that for me, in Exodus 30 and... Eight, is it? Eight and nine? I don't know. We're talking about the pattern. Yeah. 25, eight, and nine. And 40. Thank you. Exodus 25 and eight. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all instrument thereof, even so you shall make it. Mm -hmm. And they shall make an ark of shittin no, no, wood. No, 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 jump down to 40 now. That was good there. Go ahead to 40. Okay, 40. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Okay, so he told Moses twice right there. Make it after the pattern, Moses. 
Make it after the pattern, Moses. Don't mess up. Because if you mess up, if there is one little thing out of place, I'm not coming down. <laughs> right? <laughs> but Moses does what he's told. And he builds it to exact specifications. And Yahweh comes down and he enters into that tabernacle. And that, again, is showing that it is Yahweh, Yahshua, because that who is in the cloud, who is back here in the tent, Yahshua, Joshua. And we know this because Moses went out to talk to him as a man talking to a friend. And when Moses left, the cloud, Yahshua stayed within, they saw the cloud come down. They saw Moses go back, and all the people run out to their, and they're watching Moses. See him, he's heading out to the tent. And the cloud and a pillar comes down and stands in front of the door and converses. And they see this cloud come down and talk with Moses as a, a man talks with his friend. And Moses leaves, but Joshua stays in the tent. So, right? so it is Joshua who comes in and he fills this tabernacle with smoke. And that law being put in here shows that Joshua is that law that is coming into that tabernacle, which you are, which is... Again, a tabernacle is a dwelling place for the soul. And it is Yahshua the Messiah who you want sitting on the seat of that soul. And that's what this coming down here represents. With that, I will say hallelujah. All praises go to Yahshua. Our next speaker for today will be the dean of our school, Dr. Terry Walsh. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get that board, please? Yeah. Well, good afternoon. I enjoyed that greatly. There was a lot that was covered. And uh, this morning in our early class, uh, we also had a lot of other things that were covered. In fact, Dr. Ed Bowman went into, again, a lot of details about light and the things in the physical body that involve physical light, how that points to the soul or the spiritual embodiment of man and the light of the uh, life, which is Yahshua the Messiah. And there's a correlation between the physical and the spiritual. So if you've got, and you know, like we've said before, if you have a physical body, then there's also a spiritual inner man and they follow exactly the same pattern. If we want to understand about the spiritual you look at the physical because that's what Yahweh made the physical for or the natural made it to understand the spiritual. And uh, perhaps uh, a couple of little things on that. There's a, several different items if we get an opportunity to cover would be good. But this thing about the light. If you would please go to Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 and then go to John chapter 1 in fact, I'm going to look up I mean, some scriptures here just so you've got them. I'll mention them, um, and I can re-mention them. It's no problem. Don't worry about it if you forget, but I'll mention it to you. If you go to John the 8th chapter, the 20th verse, and then go to John the 1st chapter and the 9th verse, 8th chapter and 12th verse, 9th chapter, 5th verse, 12th chapter, 35th verse. I can give them to you again. John 1, 9, John 8, 12, John 9. If you have those scriptures. Yes, Isaiah 8, 20. Isaiah 8 and 20. Mm -hmm. To the law and to, to the testimony, mm -hmm. if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. Okay, now here he says, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Let's just look at this. Okay. What is the, what is the law? What is it? Okay. It's the things written in the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy. Right? Okay? The testimony 
is the next 34 books, okay, which are what? Joshua through Malachi. This comprises the Old Testament. Okay? Now the things that Joshua did are the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Okay? And that is done by Joshua the Messiah. And that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right? Primarily. Alright? So really, the things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are going to reflect the same things that you would read about back in Genesis through Deuteronomy and Joshua through Malachi. But they'd be the fulfillment. And then you have the spiritual fulfillment which is the same as the New Testament or the New Covenant Not the Old Testament, but the New Testament, and that is not in the Bible. Now, there are things in the Bible that were written under the New Testament time period, but the New Testament is not in the Bible. And I know people are saying, what? It says right there in the flyleaf, New Testament, right? But if you go get, and, 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 and I'm going to make this point, we'll come back and do what we can do with this in a moment. But if you go get 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, okay, and go back also, I need two readers working on this. Jeremiah 31, he's already mentioned this, okay? So Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and then 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Uh, start about the third verse, if you would, please. Okay. 2 Corinthians 3 and 3. Right. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah. Okay, an epistle is a letter, right? Okay, so it's a letter written by the Messiah, and he's talking to the people or writing to these people, and he's saying that the people are, the people or the souls of those people are written on by Yahshua the Messiah, who is the Holy Spirit. So he says, as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah, or the letter written by Yahshua, please read. The epistle of the Messiah ministered by us. Now, and it was ministered by us, and he's referring to himself as an apostle, and others that preach the gospel. So a preacher is supposed to be simply an instrument of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, the, 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 the minister speaks, but is not supposed to be speaking his own concepts, but it's supposed to be the Holy Spirit speaking in that person, and when he speaks, his speech is supposed to be the speech of the Holy Spirit to write upon the tables of the hearts and the minds or the souls of those that hear. And I, do not lose where you're at, but I want to confirm what I'm just said, go back and get Psalms 45, verse 1, without losing those other scriptures. Okay? And I want you to see where these are. Okay? So he says, you're the epistle of the Messiah. You're ministered or written by us. Go ahead and read Psalms 45, verse 1. Uh-huh. Psalms 45 on 1. Right. My heart is in, in indicting, indicting yes. a good matter. My heart, he says, now, now the psalmist David is writing here, and he says, my heart is indicting or my heart is overflowing with a good matter. Please read. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. And he says, I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. Now, the king that he's talking about is who? My tongue is... Well, no, no, no. Let's answer the question. Who is the king that he's talking about? That king is Yahshua the Messiah. Remember, David, who wrote this, also was a king, right? And his son Solomon was made king after him, correct? But is he really talking about himself as a man or his son Solomon as a man? 
No, because they are both symbols of the King of Kings, which is Yahshua the Messiah. Okay? So when he says, my heart's overflowing with a good matter, I speak of the things which I have made touching the king or pertaining to the king. The things that he's writing about pertain to Yahshua the Messiah as the king of kings. And this goes back to something the previous speaker had mentioned. Back here, when Yahweh made the old covenant with these people, he told them that if they would obey his voice, he would make them a kingdom of priests. They would be priests in the kingdom. But who was going to be the king? Yeah. Yahweh himself, the creator himself, who is, whose proper name is Yahweh. Okay? And by the way, let me just give you a little secret right here. Okay? Yahweh, the creator, was Yahshua the Messiah. Okay? And I can show you that in the Bible. I can prove that to you. But the point is, this man was not revealed as being the king of kings as Yahweh back here, except to a limited few people. Moses was one of those limited few. But anyway, David's writing later on, seven, eight hundred years after that. And he says, my heart's overflowing with a good... In other words, I can't contain it. Okay? He's excited. He says, my heart's indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I've made pertaining to the King of Kings, Yahshua the Messiah. Please read. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And then he says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And this morning they were talking about a pen and what the pen is and so forth. But he says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Well, where is he writing? He's writing on the minds of those that hear his right. tongue. Right. right? Okay? All right. So now go back to 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 3. Yes, sir. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah ministered by us, All right. written not with ink. Now, wait a minute. When an epistle of a person or a letter the person or the soul that believes is written on, nobody gets inside your brain and writes with pen and ink. Right? right? But it's written by the words, right. which is the Spirit. Yahshua even said, the words I speak unto you, they are what? Spirit. They are spirit and they are life. Yes. He says, the words I speak unto you are spirit in our life. That's how the writing takes place. Continue, please. Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living Elohim. Yes, please. Not in tables of stone. Now, th this is not written in tables of stone. Why would he even bring that up? Because the old covenant, the first covenant, was written in tables of stone. Okay? All right? Please read. Not in the tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. But it's written in the fleshly tables of the heart. Yes. And let me be clear about this. There is what they call allegorical language in the Bible. Yep. And please understand the difference between an allegory or a symbol. Because an allegory of something is symbolic language. And there's a difference between a symbol and the fact that the symbol points to. It's what in, if, if you ever want to look at this, it's, there's two different words. You can look it up. This is a little homework thing you can do. The word symbol and the word referent. Not reference, referent. R-E-F-E-R-E-N-T. Okay? The referent is the thing that the symbol is talking about. Now, when Yahshua the Messiah spoke in parables, he was using allegorical language. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like, mm -hmm. right? And he would use various different symbols to tell you what the kingdom of heaven was like. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower sowing seed. That was one example, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a field. The kingdom of heaven is like such and such. Now, let me ask you a question. When he uses things in those parables and he's talking about the birds, 
and he's talking about a man sowing seed in the field. Is he really referring to a physical man, a physical field, or physical seeds? No. He's referring to the kingdom of heaven and the king and what he does in his kingdom. So the symbol is the man, the field, the seed, the birds. But what the referent is, or the point that he's making, it's about the kingdom and about the king. Just like David said, my heart is just bubbling over with a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching who? King Yahshua. So do you understand that the point is all about Yahshua and his kingdom? Okay. So now when we read about these various different things, we need to make a distinction between something that's physical and something that's spiritual. It's the spiritual things that are what's most important. The physical thing is a symbol of the spiritual. But since you can't see, touch, taste, handle, deal with physical things, using your physical body and understand it, then you must have something physical that symbolizes the spiritual. Otherwise, you would never have any way of understanding anything about the spiritual. And the reason this is important is because you must worship Yahweh in spirit and in truth. And unless you know about the spirit, it's impossible for you to do it. And unless you know what the truth is, you can't do it that way either. And I'll get this in the Bible so you understand what I'm talking about. Okay? So, um, I, but I don't want to get off the point here. Okay? Continue where you're reading, please, in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. Yes, sir. And such trust have we through the Messiah to, Yah to God ward. Yeah, or to uh, Yahweh, that's fine. Okay, Yahweh. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Right. But our sufficiency... Now let me explain that. When he's talking about the fact that he and other preachers ministered the epistles uh, of Yahshua the Messiah or preached and caused people to literally be changed in their soul, to be born again, that's the most important thing that could happen. And he says, we trust Yahshua in doing this. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything of, uh, as of ourselves. And what I mean is this. I know that the things which I am speaking right now are capable of raising the souls of people from the dead. And I trust that. Not because I'm sufficient, but because Yahshua is doing his job. I simply trust that Yahshua does what he promised. And that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Follow me? That's what he's referring to. Continue, please. I'll go back to five. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. We're not sufficient of ourselves, but I will tell you this. Just as Paul also write, wrote, he says, we are complete in Yahshua. Yes. Right? See, we're not sufficient of ourselves, alone and by ourselves. In fact, we're fully inadequate as individuals, but as part of the body of Yahshua, with Yahshua as the head making things operate, yes. you can't beat that. Continue. But our sufficiency is of Elohim. Sure, read on. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. No, he has, he, 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 he's made us able ministers. Not made us insufficient ministers. So that's what he's talking about. He says, Yahweh has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Able to do what? Able to do what he promised he would do. Yeah. That he said he would write his law in the inward parts, yeah. cause your heart to be completely changed, yeah. cause your soul to be born again from the dead. Right. And he says, yeah, Paul experienced this. He says, and he, so he's speaking from experience here. He says, I know it. He says he's made us able ministers of the New Testament, but the New Testament is what? Read on. Not of the letter. He says the New Testament is not of the letter. In other words, what I mean is this. The New Testament is not literal. It is not 
physical. It is not carnal. Mm -hmm. It's not about flesh and blood at all. It's about Yahshua the Messiah. Okay? All right, continue, please. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. So he says the New Testament is not of the letter, but it is of the what? Spirit. It's spiritual. It is of the Spirit. So there you see that the fulfillment of what Yahweh promised, that is the New Testament, but the New Testament is not physical. It is spiritual. That's what the New Testament is. The New Testament is not of the letter. It's of the Spirit. Please read. For the letter killeth. Because the letter kills. But the Spirit giveth life. But the Spirit gives life. Now, the Old Testament law, that, those letters and everything that were written in the tables of stone and that Moses then wrote in the book and read and taught those people, what that did was killed them. And what I mean by that is it convicted them of their sin. It made them have come to face to face with the fact that they were wrong, that they had a problem, and that the only solution was Yahshua the Messiah. And they couldn't do it themselves. And do you realize they resisted that completely? And folks, the same spirit is doing exactly that today. Resisting obedience to Yahshua the Messiah. They want to be the boss and not obey Yahshua. Okay. Anyway, so you've got it not of the letter, but of the Spirit. That's what the New Testament is. Continue. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But what the Spirit does is it gives life. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say this. The Spirit that he's talking about doesn't give life to a carnal mind. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is it doesn't make a carnal mind a better carnal mind. No. Do you understand? You, you, you get the point that I'm making. Okay? In other words, we're, let me put it this way. We're not in the business of making people smarter devils. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? We're not... Now, and, and let me just say this too so you understand. This is a little side note, but it, it, this is a fact. In the process of changing or transforming carnal minds or souls that are dead into spiritual ones, inevitably we are making the devil smarter. That's happening too. I said the devil's getting smarter. And he's getting smarter because of what we're teaching. The devil is learning right here, right now, right along with you who believe in Yahshua the Messiah. Yes, he is. And that it says that Yahweh would give him all power, right? And it says in the end, knowledge would increase. And that's on both sides, mystery of righteousness and the mystery of iniquity, okay? But at the very end of the whole thing, you're going to end up seeing the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, okay? Because it says that there must come the falling away first and then, and only after that, then shall that wicked one be exposed or revealed, and Yah will consume him with the spirit of his mouth. Anyway, that's a related subject. Let me stay on point here. So he, we were going back and we were talking about to the law and to the testimony. And if they did not speak according to this word, the word here is not the letter. It's not the letter. Let me say that once more. The word is not the letter. Or literal. Therefore, folks, the word of Yahweh is not the Bible. The physical Bible is not the word of Yahweh. It is a record of the words of Yahweh. But the word of Yahweh spoke the words of Yahweh. Now, I'm not trying to be cute. I'm trying to be specific. 
so that you understand it and don't have to be confused. The word of Yahweh appeared in visions, that means they saw, and he spoke to these prophets. Who, what prophets? The prophets such as Moses that wrote the law. Such as Jeremiah and others that wrote the testimony. Where I mention him because we're going to read what Jeremiah wrote. And Jeremiah didn't get it because Jeremiah thought it up. He was recording what the word of Yahweh told him to write. The word of Yahweh is Yahweh Elohim. Go back get for me, I think it's Genesis 17.9, 17.1 uh, 17, maybe, 17, wherever it is. But it, it says back in there that the word of Yahweh appeared unto Abraham. Yeah. All right, just go find that and tell us where it's at, if you would, please. And then if you'd go over to uh, Jeremiah, the first chapter, fourth verse, okay? And then I want you to go to the 31st chapter, Jeremiah, because we were headed there. Okay? I know I got you running around all over the book, but you see, I want you to understand what we're talking about. I didn't make it up. It's in the book. And I mean the physical book and really this book. This is the book that Yahweh wrote. Moses and the prophets wrote this other book that we call the Bible. But they wrote that book because this book told them. And this is the book or this is the word. Anyway, Genesis 17, what is it? 15.1. Is it? 15.1. 17, wait, what, what verse did you say? Well, there's a couple of them. 15 verse 4, well, thank you. Um, Genesis 15 verse I'll, 1 and then verse 4, that's fine. Yeah, I'll do Genesis 15 and 1. Please. After these things, the word of Yahweh came unto Abram that's in what a I vision, wanted. saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Okay, now, the, wait a minute. Who did this? The word of Yahweh came to Abram, saying, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, obviously, well, it should be obvious. I don't know. Some people actually might even think this. But it should be obvious. Abraham, this book didn't come up talking to you. That's right. That doesn't mean that the word of Yahweh, the Bible, right. flew through the air right. and started belting out words to Abraham. What that means is the word of Yahweh, a man, yeah. right. in a spirit form, That's right. came up to Abram mm -hmm. and said, Fear not, Abram, mm -hmm. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Right. And I'm going to tell you this. The word of Yahweh sat down and had dinner with Abram. Yeah. 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 This was not only something that happened in abstraction. That word of Yahweh was able to take on a bodily form, right. sit down, and have dinner. Right. That's, right. Yep. That's why... This was the Word made flesh. And folks, listen to me. He's not instituting becoming a Word made flesh. He's fulfilling being the Word made flesh. When He came in this form, He was fulfilling. So that means He had to be the Word made flesh before this time because this is the fulfillment of what happened before. And I'm going to give you one, what Dr. Kinney called one of the greatest secrets that Yahweh ever had. Yahweh Elohim, the Creator Himself, just materialized in a physical body in the land of Egypt and was called Yahshua, the son of Nun, which in the modern English Bible is transliterated Joshua the son of Nun. But there was no J and no letter sounding like a J. And his name was not Joshua. It was simply Yahshua. And Yahshua means Yahweh is salvation. And every minister that has any education knows it. And if he's stupid enough that he doesn't know it, 
Take him to his own study Bible because it's in the footnotes throughout his own Bible. That's right. The name Yahweh and the name Yahshua is known by every educated minister. And they've got to the point to where it's so obvious that if you go ask them, they'll admit it. Because it would be so quick to show them to be stupid liars if they don't. So then you might ask them the question, well, wait a minute, if you knew this all this time, why you been telling me that he's the Lord, God, or Jesus? And yeah, that's what they'll say. And I'll tell you something, exactly what David Underwood and I heard from two ministers. One time when we went and preached in, in, in where he had lived many, many years ago in Traverse City, we went and did a special lecture there. And we had four people from the local community come to one particular of those lectures that we had. Those four people happened to be two pastors and their wives. And they were friends. Okay? And we started going into the thing, and the one, they were rude, overbearing but it was very interesting, the, the confession that they made. The guy just interrupted and he says, stop, stop. I mean, we're preaching the gospel. He says, stop. He says, look, we know all this. In other words, we're talking about the name of Father is Yahweh and the name is Yah of Son is Yahshua. He says, stop, we know all this. We're preachers. They hadn't identified themselves before that. We're preachers, pastors here at local churches. He says, but I'm going to tell you something. Some people like chicken, some people like steak, and I'm going to feed them what they want. Now that was his exact words. But of course he would never say that in front of his congregation. In other words, I'll lie to you just so long as you continue to pay me my... You follow me? But he could admit it to us because we knew. And it was obvious he knew. And it's like, look, obviously we know this. We've been, we, we got this in our training in ministerial school. It's in everything we've ever read. Of course we know that the name of the Creator is Yahweh. Of course we know that the name of the Savior is Yahshua. Obviously, we know that. You ain't got to tell us that. But I'm going to lie to everybody else so I can get my way. That's, in essence, what they said. Now, I'll tell you this. If you got to run from a bear or a lion, and there's scripture about this, but if you got to, if you got to take off and run, okay, and you get to panting, I do not care whether you want to call the Creator, Lord, God, Jesus, Allah, Buddha, Vishnu, Shiva, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter what you want to call him. You can try and call him by your own name. And, and people get to the point where they do that just boldly. Oh, I'm God. I'm in charge. And can't nobody tell me nothing. Follow me that attitude. Okay? But I do not care what goes on. You get to run in for your life. I don't care who you think you worship. You're going to be going. <laughs> oh. Who are you calling on? <gasps> and your heart is going to be pounding. Right? And your feet are going to be going, Yahweh, 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 <laughs> in your arms. Yeah. And once you get into that car, that door is going to come open fast. Yeah, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and the pistons are going to be going, Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. And if it's in the rain, the windshield wipers are going to be going, Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. That's right, and the birds might be going by. Yahweh. Right? And if you happen to be driving by the seashore, 
The sea will be talking to you. He said, the heavens declare the glory of El. The firmament has, shows his handiwork. Day unto day they utter speech. Night unto night they show knowledge. Here's the problem. People don't learn. And Yahweh's speaking. But the word of Yahweh came unto Abraham. Said, fear not, Abram. I am your shield, and I am your exceeding great reward. Now go over to Jeremiah 1, verse 4, please. I don't, I, I, go ahead. Then the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh. Well, who are you reading from? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. All right, now, Abram was in the law. Moses wrote that because the word of Yahweh came to him. Now, Jeremiah is writing from in the testimony, and he says, The word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, and then the rest of the book of Jeremiah is basically an account of things that the word of Yahweh had Jeremiah write. Now, I'll go over to Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, and go to the 29th verse, and I'm going to try and run through something fairly efficiently here, but I need you to be paying attention to exactly what the point is here. Read on, please. Jeremiah 31, 29. Jeremiah 31, 29. Yes, ma'am. In those days they shall no more. The fathers have eaten. In those days they shall say no, no more. more. The fathers have eaten a what? A sour grape. A sour grape. And the children's teeth are set on edge. And the children's teeth are set on edge. What's he talking about? And let me ask you a question. Are you... I don't mean to be derogatory, but I really got to point this out. Are you really ignorant enough to think that Yahweh is prophesying about somebody eating a physical grape that's sour and his children's teeth are set on edge? In other words, his children taste the sourness and go, ugh. No, he's not talking about that. What he's talking about is the fact of this, that under the Old Testament, the sins of the father were inherited by their children. And if you go back to the Ten Commandments, you go back to the commandment where Yahweh said, Do not take the name of Yahweh your Elohim in vain, for Yahweh shall not hold him guiltless that taketh away his name in vain. And then he goes on and he says, for Yahweh will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. And he shows mercy to thousands of them that love him. So if the iniquity of the fathers would be visited upon the children to the third and the fourth generation, you can see the analogy. You can see the parabolic language. You can see the symbolism when he says, oh, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, the children's teeth are set on edge. But he's prophesying in Jeremiah, and he says that the days are going to come when that's going to change. Under the Old Testament, the sins of the father were visited upon the children. And this is something people today don't get. That's why they don't understand sin and forgiveness of sin. This is one thing. People grow up today and they think, oh, I haven't sinned. Oh, I don't know, there's no sin. I haven't done anything wrong. And they have no clue what sin is and what it isn't. And I don't have time today to acquaint you with all the details, except I'm going to say this. Sin is the transgression of Yahweh's commandment. Now, whatever commandment he has that you have to obey, if you don't do it, it's sin. But when Adam sinned, all of his children for 4,000 years, that's four generations in Yahweh's eyesight, all of his kids for 4,000 years inherited the penalty of the sin of Adam. And that goes from Adam all the way on down to the birth of who? Yahshua the Messiah after 4,000 years. And he came to take away the sin of the world. Yes. Meaning this, that sin that was inherited from Adam, mm -hmm. 
Yahshua took it away. He also, as was pointed out earlier, took away or redeemed Israel from their sins. So he took care of both the Jews that were under this law and the Gentiles, including everybody else. Okay? But now, he's prophesying in Jeremiah's time, he says, that they will no longer say that the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. And under the New Testament, he's referring to that. Read on, please. Um, but everyone shall die for his own iniquity. In other words, you, you transgress, you disobey Yahweh, you defy Yahweh, you die. But that doesn't mean that your kids are going to pay for it. Follow me? Okay? All right. But I will tell you this. You defy Yahweh, you die. And I'm not talking about necessarily a physical death now. I'm talking about something far worse than that. I'm talking about the death of your soul in the lake of eternal fire. Please continue. Every man that eateth the sour grape. Every man that eats the sour grape. His teeth shall be set on edge. His own teeth are the ones that are going to be set on edge. Please continue. 31, 31, Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, say Yahweh. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will make a new covenant and the testament, the new testament is the written record of the new covenant. And with the now house hold it. Go ahead. I want I want that to sink in. The New Testament is the New Covenant. But a testament or a testimony of something is simply the official record. A covenant is an agreement. Now, if Dr. Cain and Shropshire and I make a covenant or make an agreement, okay, and we want to make sure that it's clear and that it is something that it can be enforceable, what do we do? We put it in writing. We sign it and we make sure it's recorded officially. Right. All those kinds of things so that the identity of the individuals are involved and it's recorded in a way that it can't be altered. Right. And then it becomes an official and permanent record. You're talking about a covenant of salt that it talks about in the Bible in I think four different places. Salt is a preservative. And when it refers to a covenant of salt, one of the things about a covenant of salt is that a covenant is made in such a way that it is to be preserved or not to be changed. Okay, it's to be preserved like salt preserves something. It's to be official. It's to go on record. And it is usually, by the way, back there, their practices were to make what people would call a covenant of salt over a meal. And the meal would be seasoned or salted. Follow me? In other words, you sit down, you have a meal, okay? It's like we go, we have a business luncheon, okay? And we make an agreement over that business luncheon, sign the papers, right? And if I'm the one that initiated that, I pick up the tab. Follow me? That's what Yahweh did with Israel. Okay? And that's what he does under the New Testament. It makes it a permanent, irrevocable covenant. But the testament of the covenant is the paperwork. It's what's written. Now, here's what I, I hope I got made this clear earlier. Where is the New Testament written? In your heart, in your mind, if you've believed it. And what is it written with? Is it written with pen and ink? No, it's written with the spirit of the living Elohim. Yeah. How is it written with his pen? Through the preaching of the gospel. Because we are able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. So the record or the testament or the covenant of Yahweh is the Holy Spirit written in your heart or mind by one that preaches the gospel with the Holy Spirit. And that is where the New Testament is. This thing that they call the New Testament in the Bible is not the New Testament. It is a written record of the words, not word, but words of Yahweh that were written during the New Testament era or period. period. 
You follow me? But the New Testament ain't here. It's supposed to be in here. Follow me? All right, all right, continue on. I, go ahead. Uh, I would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And he even tells you who he's going to make it with, and people don't understand this. He made the New Testament with the Jews and the Jews only. The house of Israel and the house of Judah. He did it on the day of Pentecost. And these were Jews and Jews only that received the Holy Spirit on that day. Now that doesn't mean that the Jews and the Jews only are the only ones that will end up receiving the New Testament. But they got it first. And then seven years later, the New Testament was confirmed with the Gentiles. You see, watch this real quick. Okay? When Yahweh built a temple, had a temple built by Solomon up here, okay? that was David's son. Okay? where he was talking about in the king. Solomon had this temple built, and how many years did it take to build it? Seven. Seven. And how many years did it... Okay, and, so let me just say this. I, I, I'll take one piece at a time. The, te the, 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 the temple took seven years to build. So it was started seven years before it was finished. And the last things that were to go in the temple didn't go in there until after seven years. So now, if this is a physical temple, and it's a symbol of the temple of Yahshua's body, yeah. Yahweh is not worshipped in temples made with hands. Right. He is worshipped in spirit and in truth. Right. You've got to be in Yahshua, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right. That's how you worship in truth. And he is the Spirit. So you've got to be in Yahshua to worship. And, and let me pause right here and say this, because I want this clarified. People say this is a school, and it's not a church. We do not come here to worship Yahweh. That's accurate. But I want you to understand the rest of the story. You come here to learn. Once you learn... And know, you got to learn, then know, then understand. And once that takes place, you worship. And you don't have to go to a building to worship. Because if that is the case, your soul is translated into the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah. And you are made part of the body of Yahshua the Messiah. So if Yahshua at that point is in you, then you can worship in spirit and in truth without relocating anywhere. Right. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you. If the Holy Spirit is in you. So, do you understand the rest of the story? All right, now. So, he says here, uh, I'm trying to get through the verse. Go ahead and read it. <laughs> Um, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day I took them by the hand okay, to bring so, them out of the land of and Egypt. And I apologize, I half completed the thought, so let me just finish this. Okay. It took seven years to complete the building of this temple. The true body of Yahshua, the Messiah, is the temple. That temple is comprised of the souls of all saved individuals and his kingdom and his body will include his angels. Okay? But, he made the covenant with the Jews, the new one. Why? Because he's following the same pattern, same pattern and format as he did under the old one. He made this Old Testament with the Jews, right. so he makes the New Testament with the Jews. Right. But, he provided in his spiritual temple, or in his purpose, a place for the Gentiles also. But the Gentiles were brought in seven years later. So it took him seven years to complete the building of his spiritual temple. Just like it took seven years to complete the building of this physical temple. And let me tell you this. This temple stood without being molested for how long? 33 years after that, right? Okay, so 
It was not molested for 33 years. How long was this man, Yahshua, on the earth before he was molested or crucified? 33 years. Huh. So, 33 years of his life, seven years in the building of the temple is how many total years? 40, and that's the way it was with this temple. Seven years in the building, 33 years unmolested, 40 years. You follow me? Okay. That's a side note. All right, you can go back and read, and I'll try and, <laughs> I'll try and stay on track here. Okay, uh, Jeremiah 31, 32. Yes. Not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers. Now, when I make this new covenant, it's not going to be like I made with their fathers. What, when? Go ahead. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, he brought them here to Mount Sinai, and 50 days after he brought them out uh, through the Red Sea, he spoke that law to them and made the covenant with Israel. Please read. And Oh, and let me say this. 50 days after Yahshua resurrected, he put the Holy Spirit in them or made the new covenant with them. Right. Make sense? Yeah. So he brought them three days mm -hmm. resurrecting through the Red Sea, 50 days later, spoke the Old Covenant. Three days, death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. 50 days later, spoke the New Covenant. So it's the same pattern, but the covenant is not going to be the same. So there are comparisons and there are contrasts. Do you understand? Please read. Which my covenant they break... Although I was a husband unto them, say Yahweh. Now, they broke Yahweh's covenant. Right. But that's one difference. The new covenant will not be broken. Right. Go ahead and continue. But this shall be the, the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says, say Yahweh. All right, now, wait a minute. When did he say that the new covenant would be made with the house of Israel? After those days. After those days. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. I can nail down for you when that would be. All you got to do, you do your homework. You go look this up. Matthew, the third chapter, the very first verse. And it says right there that in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. Right? And Yahshua came into his ministry Right then, in those days. But after Yahshua's ministry, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, he poured out the Spirit, and that was the new covenant after those days. Please continue. After those days, say Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts. I'll put my law on tables of stone again. No, no I'll write it in a physical book. No. no, I'll put it in their inward parts. Please read. And write it in their hearts. And the New Testament is going to be written in their hearts. And I, I told you it's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Please continue. And I will be their Elohim. And I will be their Elohim. That's an important statement because Yahweh's name means I will be. And he said I will be what I will to be. And Yahweh willed to become salvation. And he willed to be their Elohim. And he willed that they be his people. And if Yahweh wills it, it will be. Please continue. And they shall be my people. Yes. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh. Now, man is not going to be doing the teaching over here. I got through telling you that this is not a man teaching you. You're supposed to be speaking with the spirit of the living Elohim. Yes. Do you follow me? Yes. He says, yeah, we were able ministries of the New Testament, but it's not of the letter, it's of the spirit. Yes. Please continue. For they shall all know me. Yep. From the least of them unto the greatest of them. They shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And let me say this, that requires that they learn of him. Yes. Then come to know him. And then come to understand him. And the only way that happens is if he teaches them. Yes. He's got to teach them. Otherwise it ain't happening. Please continue. 
And greatest of them say, yeah, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay, that's enough. Barely got started on anything. But I hope that's encouraging. hope it gives you also some genuine understanding about some of the things of Yahweh on some level. And I pray Yahweh bless you with wisdom and understanding. Praise Yahshua. Classes are held every Wednesday and Friday from 7 to 9 p.m. and 11 to 1 on Sunday. We thank you for your support and join us again. Praise Yahshua. You can hear it in the wind as it blows through the trees. You can see it in the wings of a bird flying free. You can see it in a flower as it reaches for the sky. Every ocean praises Yahweh in overwhelming signs. So let's sing hallelujah, let's sing hallelujah, let's sing hallelujah, let's sing, let's sing hallelujah, let's sing hallelujah. is a masterpiece no artist could touch oh no no every color that he painted he painted it with love and they shall be my people and his signature is seen on everything he made even you for every breath you breathe you breathe his living name so let Yahweh has given you is precious, blessed. It is something to be cherished and treated that way. It is not something to be ignored and to use a ho-hum attitude about. And it's so easy for us to do that because it doesn't on the outside look as glorious as it really is on the inside. And you on, need to look on the inside to really appreciate it. I, I hope that's I hope that's encouragement as well as warning. Okay? Thank Yahshua. So let's sing. Hallelujah. This room and moving chairs around, and every time I come back in, they're rearranged. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Hallelujah. Let's sing. Sing, 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 let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing, hallelujah, let's sing. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the